so the question now is how AI forces universities to change and what an AI-powered university of the future could look like. And I'm very happy now to introduce Manuel Dolre to you. He's an economist and entrepreneur. He's co-founder, founding president, and currently CLO, Chief Learning Officer of Code, a university you might know, the University of Applied Sciences, with study programs related to digital product development and an innovative learning concept based on curiosity and entrepreneurship. And why is it so interesting now to follow this uh, uh, um, part of the day? Because a lot of people are kind, kind of have a consensus as the, on that university's will have to change, but not on how. So let's have a deep dive with Manuel and a very warm round of applause accompanying him. Are you there? No, not, not yet. Kind of, here you go. Oh. Okay, here you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so don't be confused. Um, I spoke to some of you yesterday um, in, in German, but I had this in as a talk in English because I heard that the University Future Festival wanted to be more international, so I wanted to contribute to that. And also Code, uh, Code University is an English-speaking community. We have students from 80 different countries, so everything we do is in English. And of course, talking about AI and algorithms means we're using a lot of English words anyway, so um, I thought it would be a good idea to do this talk in English. And let me start with something that is a bit uh, more looking into the past than, than into the future. Um, what you see here is an ad, an ad from the New York Edison Company that was posted in 1920 in a New York newspaper, and it was basically advertising the use of electricity, because Back in the days, electricity, of course, was already there. It was discovered, but people weren't, uh, weren't using it because they were used to the old ways, doing things with steam-powered engines and uh, just other, other means than electricity. So Edison and his, uh, his team, they thought it wouldn't be necessary to explain to people what they could use electricity for and how they could change the way they were doing things And um, I'm using this as an example of um, something that seems quite obvious for people who are already involved, for people who are already, um, yeah, in a way, it have been introduced to a new technology and have already started thinking about how to use this technology and how it changes our lives and the future we are going to live in, while a lot of other people aren't aware of the fact that this technology even exists Uh, we're all, in a way, suffering from the curse of knowledge. Um, there was a very interesting experiment done um, by a Stanford psychology student. Um, maybe we can do, do this together uh, just as an experiment. I'll, I'll clap a rhythm to you, and your ch job is to guess the song that I'm clapping. Let's wear it quickly. If you don't know the experiment, do you have any idea what the song might be? Okay, that's a bad example. I, would, I was trying to demonstrate something different. So they did a study. Um, they took some famous uh, songs, and students were clapping these to other students. And it turned out that only 2.5% of the students that these songs were clapped to were actually able to discover the song um, the other students were clapping. The interesting thing wasn't that there were only 2.5% of the students who discovered the song, but that the students who were clapping believed that it would be 50%, because they already knew, and once you know, you cannot, you cannot imagine anymore what it feels like not to know. And I think that's something we're all suffering from in a bit, because, of course, this is another talk about AI, and we've only been talking about AI the whole day and the day yesterday, so it feels like, isn't it already enough? No, it's not because we're in this bubble, and we are all suffering from this curse of knowledge. There's a quote from a science fiction author, I'm blanking on the name. Um, he said, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And I think this is the, what's happening right now. 
We are all living in this future already. We are using these tools. We are getting introduced to the technology. We are thinking about how it might change the future. While right next door, in a hospital or in a school, nobody's even thinking about this technology, let alone started using it already. So that's why I think it's, it's very important that we also think about um, educational institutions and how they can start introducing not just their students, but basically everyone involved uh, to this technology and how we can use it and make sure that everyone gets a chance to start working with it and get an idea of the future we're all going to live in. But of course, doing these predictions, talking about this kind of future is hard because these predictions, especially about the future, um, are unreliable and, and we might be wrong with a lot of things that we're doing. But we need to have these kinds of predictions because as educators, it is our job to prepare students uh, of any age for the future. And this future includes the future in five or 10 or even 15 years. That's the future our students need to be able to not just survive in, but thrive in, be successful, be uh, co-creating and co-designing the society they're living in. So we have to have an idea what this future looks like because if we don't, how are we able to prepare our students for it? How are we able to figure out what it takes uh, to be successful um, in this future? And we can all agree, I think you've all heard of this, we are preparing our students for the VUCA world, um, and VUCA typically stands for uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That is what the future definitely looks like. It's already there, we can already feel it every day. Everything is becoming more volatile, more uncertain, more complex, and more ambiguous. And I just took the liberty to replace the last one oh, with AI. That's not how it's supposed to look like. Well, something went wrong with the design. Um, but VUCA can only, of course, also stand for, for AI instead of ambiguity. And I think that's definitely the future we need to prepare our students for. So I think I'm, I'm convinced that we need to rethink higher education for a world or in a world full of artificial intelligence, full of these tools and technologies, full of people who are using it and full of potential to, um, to use these tools. And the question is, how do we do that? And what would this higher education institution look like? So we need to talk about certain, certain aspects of, of learning, certain aspects of higher education. And by the way, this is where I uh, ran out of time to generate these beautiful background images um, that I did before with Midjourney. Um, so from now on, it's only black and white. So we need to talk about how to prevent students from cheating using AI. No, of course not. That's definitely not the topic we should be discussing. Because if you have an assessment that uh, someone can, can pass using AI, then you're testing for the wrong competencies. Then you're testing for a competency that obviously can already be done by an AI. So why should a student be concerned with that competency? So we need, of course, to think about other things. We need to think about how to redefine and evaluate learning outcomes. So what is it that our students need to learn? given the fact that they will all be working and living in a world where artificial intelligence tools are everywhere. And um, that is a challenge. And it's not easy. I will try to give an answer to that, but it's definitely not easy because we're so used to testing things that already today can be done by an AI that we're definitely in trouble if we don't redefine what we think are meaningful learning outcomes for our students and if we don't redefine how we actually observe and measure successful learning when it comes to students. We also need to look at how to redesign learning concepts and environments. That is the next big step. If I start questioning the definition of learning outcomes, then I also have to look at the learning environment that we're providing. And our learning environments in schools and also in universities are very much designed to just passing on knowledge to students and then testing them whether or not they've memorized this knowledge. And we need to th rethink the way our learning environments are designed. We need to rethink how the learning concepts work and what kind of freedom they give to our students to explore, what kind of challenges they present to the students. So this is another big challenge, and I think we have to look into this more closely. And the third thing is, we, of course, have to think about how to not educate but empower our students and help them to be the ones in charge, not just when it comes to their own learning experience, but also, of course, when it comes to learning about AI, understand the technology, 
be able to know enough about this technology to have an idea of what it might do in the future and how it might impact them. Also to learn with AI, to use this as a tool that can enhance learning. I'm dreaming of a university where every student has a personal learning assistant that's tailored to their needs, that's really a learning assistant, a digital one that knows what the students are struggling with, what they're looking for, presents the best learning resources, helps them overcome uh, procrastination, and so on. So this is all the things that AI can do, and our students need to understand how to do it. We need to empower them so they, can, they, they are able to do this themselves. And they should be able to experience and explore the potential of AI. So they need to be the active part in that. It's not enough to lecture them about it. They need to be able to do this by themselves, to really experience what it means to use this technology, to understand its limitations and also its potential. So that is, means redesigning and rethinking the learning environments we present. Um, and, of course, we're preparing our students for a future, um, but it's not a future where AI takes away your job. It's a future, and I think we've also touched on this uh, in other talks, it's a future where someone using AI, understanding AI enough that they can use it to leverage their own output to be more productive and more creative, is taking away the job from someone who doesn't. So this is definitely something our students need to understand and be able to do to not just survive but be successful and thrive in this future we're preparing them for. <clears throat> and by the way, if you know who said this for the first time, um, I'd, I'd be happy to hear. So let's imagine this kind of university of the future where researchers are able to tap into the potential of AI. So far, I'm only, I've been only talking about students, but it's also about researchers. And when I say researchers, I don't just mean computer scientists and mathematicians. I mean every researcher, researchers in biology, <coughs> researchers in chemistry, but also researchers in the social science and the humanities. Imagine what AI can do when it comes to qualitative research, data collection and data analysis, you can be so much more productive in your own research if as a researcher you understand the tools and the technology you can use. So this is definitely something our universities need to do. We need to introduce all of our researchers to these tools and technologies so they can start incorporating this into their research and from a perspective of the humanities also do research on the technology and how it influences our society so we can also have a discussion about AI alignment and what this future might look like and how we can maybe shape it so it's a bit more human friendly than it could end up. And of course... Imagine a university where all professors, again, not just the computer scientists, but all professors have an idea of how AI impacts their field. If you are an architecture professor and you're preparing your students to become architects in a future that's five or ten years from now, you need to have an idea of what, how the field of architecture looks like with all these tools out there. And again, we're not talking about the tools as they are today. We're talking about the tools as they will be five or ten years from now. So you as a professor, you need to have an understanding of these tools and technologies so you yourself can come up with an idea of how this future looks like. And the same goes for people um, in the field of medicine. If you're preparing your students to be future doctors, they need to know how to work with data, how to work with algorithms, how to use this, because it's already changing the way we do medicine, we do diagnosis and find out the best therapies and evaluate outcomes. And that's going to be their part, part of their lives. And, of course, if you are the one teaching future teachers, it is vitally important that they themselves have an idea of what this future looks like so they can pass it on to their students as well. So that's a discussion we have to have in our universities with everyone who's involved in teaching and preparing students. They need to have an understanding of the technology so they can figure out what it will do to their field and how it changes the way we need to prepare our students for certain jobs. <clears throat> and of course, the students. Students should be enabled and encouraged to work with AI. So let's imagine a university where this is possible, where students are not just learning, but actually using the technology and experimenting with it and getting, getting familiar with it. And this is probably the biggest challenge. Of course, you can introduce your professors to this technology and have discussion groups about how it might change the field of biology or architecture, but how do you change the learning concept so students can actually start using these tools? Um, that's definitely uh, one of the biggest challenges. And in the end, let's reimagine the whole university. 
a whole university that has been redesigned with the, t the potential, but also the threats of AI in mind. And it, this goes on. You can think about learning uh, platforms that are not just for administration, but actually supporting students' learning experience. You can start collecting data, not just to have data or to sell it, but actually to support your students in a better way, to understand how they are learning, wh where they are struggling. So all of these things could be done if we start rethinking and redesigning the university experience for everyone involved with the technology that we have today and also with the technology that we will have or might have in the future. That is a discussion that we desperately need to have. So, what should we do? I mean, of course, we should come together, as we do here, and have these kinds of discussions, but I think we can do more. So, maybe let's focus on project-based learning, because for me, that's the key of helping students be in charge of their own learning experience and get the chance to work with these tools and technologies. So, l give them the chance to use AI in their projects to figure out what they can do in their field, whatever the challenge will be, and see how they can use this technology in a meaningful way so it actually makes a difference and solves some kind of problem. Once students get a chance to do that, they will start asking questions, and they will ask different questions than if you're just lecturing them. They will ask new questions, but they will also have a motivation to learn more, and then that means they're familiarizing themselves with the topic in a different way. So I think that's one of the ways forward to find out how to introduce more project-based learning into the learning environments that we have today in schools and also in universities, because it's the best way, not just to introduce students to new technologies and help them understand it, but also for students to have this experience of self-determination, that they are not just a product or some small piece of a bigger, bigger puzzle, but they can actually do something. They can make a difference with what they're doing. And apart from all the AI discussions, I think one of the most important experiences in learning is this experience of self-determination, that you yourself matter and that you yourself make a difference with what you're doing. That's, very, that's a very empowering part. So we can hit two birds with one stone um, here. We can use project-based learning to introduce students to new technologies and allow them to explore and also help them have this feeling of self-determination and self-efficacy here. We also need, in every university, have something that we at Code call science, technology, and society program, where scientists, researchers, students, professors from all disciplines and fields come together and have a discussion about how this technology influences science and influences our society. We have to have these discussions. We have, we've touched on the alignment problem quite a few times. We need to, to and universities should be the place where this discussion happens, where people from all fields come together and think about this and agree or disagree on certain ideas that we have for the future and what we can do today to shape this future into something that we all want to live in. Um, as I said, we call this science, technology, and society. You can call it whatever you want, but you need to start bringing people together and not just educating them about the technology, but bringing them together to have these kinds of discussions. And the last thing, no, it's not the last thing, sorry. <coughs> we need to have techno literacy for all. So the basic data literacy, techno literacy that allows you to even start understanding the technology. I mean, we've had talks here yesterday um, that already went pretty deep in terms of what the technology is and how it works and how it might progress, we should all be able to understand at least what's going on there. So basic techno literacy should be um, something that's for everyone, every student. Again, not just the computer scientists, but really everyone needs to have this basic understanding. It's probably as important as being able to read and write in these days. And we need uh, to empower our educators. We need to empower our educators so they themselves can learn, they themselves can develop these new ideas, um, and then start passing them on to their students, redesigning and recreating the learning environments. Um, because if we don't, the, these educators, they are kind of the multipliers that we need. So this is a main focus for me, um, and I think it should be for everyone, for every institution. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. That's a quote from Alan Kay, one of the early computer pioneers. And it is really the best way to express what I think we should all be trying to do. We, of course, ourselves can try to predict the future by inventing it. But more importantly, we should enable our students to invent their own future. And that in the age of AI. Thank you. Thank you so very much.
My first question is about which students are you talking? All of them. Like all faculties? Yes. I think that's the main difference in this discussion. Most of the time focusing on computer scientists, informatic in Germany, or statisticians or mathematicians. I think this is a basic uh, illiteracy, techno-literacy, and everyone should be part of this. Okay. Um, um, if you have to do with the HR car or the KM car mm -hmm. and the pace of move towards the future, yeah. it might not exactly be the pace of ChatGBT. Yeah. So we have this incredible gap of transformation here and there. And we talked about school books earlier. So how do we bring this closer together? Because it's very, you know, yeah. these professors, they might hold on to what they learned, etc. So how to really create an openness within the ecosystem of, of your university learning for becoming a co-pilot embracing the AI for all faculties? How? Yeah. I think we need to start with the educators, the teachers, the professors. I think that's the key. And with every, every team, every university, every school, you will have some who will be reluctant to, to move into that direction and probably say, hey, I'm going to be out here in a couple of years. I don't really care. Let me alone. But there will also be those who will happily embrace this and every chance they get to learn about this and figure out how they can help their students. These are the multipliers that we need. So we need to focus on empowering and training the educators. Because if we wait for HR cars and KM cars to actually change the, the framework that we're operating mm. in, then I agree. Um, then it's probably too okay, late for everything. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the tablet in the moment because it went black. <laughs> so I can't take the digital questions. I, I very much apologize for that. I'm very happy to take your questions in the mm. room. Yeah, we have one in third row, and we work on the tablet to bring it back. My name is Jochen Ehrenreich from DHB W Heilbronn. Uh, dear Manuel, I have a question about uh, AI in education. So um, I think we need to distinguish between students and educators using AI and students and educators building their own AI. Of course, at Code University, you are uh, educating your students to build their own AI, but Shouldn't uh, students from all subjects be able to build their own AI um, or to, to experience how it is being built? Uh, I have an example. We have a finance professor who says, I have tons of data. I have ideas what I want to do with the data. But AI is a black box. I don't know how to use AI, how to employ it and then I cannot, cannot teach it. So um, every school student, every high school student uh, will use ChatGPT, but that's not the same as actually understanding how mm. to build their own mm -hmm. AI application. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's an excellent point. I don't think it's actually a black and white thing where you say you're either using it or you're building your own training your own algorithms, I think there's a gray area in between and we have to move into that. I absolutely agree it's not enough to just be able to use ChatGPT, um, but my 10-year-old can do this. Um, you have to start understanding how the technology works, but then there's still probably a big gap from having a basic understanding of how it works and also their, its limitations and its potential to the point where they can say, hey, I'm training my own algorithms, I'm running my own GPUs here, and so And somewhere in there is probably the sweet spot that we should aim for, and that's what I mean with techno-literacy. It's much more than just knowing how to use a technology in terms of, hey, there's a screen sure. and I can press buttons and then something happens. It's really understanding what's happening behind the mm -hmm. screen, but then again, there's still a huge gap to the point where you can actually start deploying your own systems. But that's definitely a point this, where we have to have a discussion about where this sweet spot actually is. How much of an understanding do you need? Um, I mean, we had this discussion with, a lot with social media, and I've already I've always seen students starting to ask different questions once, for example, they, they understood how Facebook works. Not just as a tool they're using, but as a company, for example. Once you start having a discussion about the, the business model of Facebook, mm -hmm. they start asking questions. Mm -hmm. I've seen students, also younger high school students, once they had their first website that they've um, la launched live, and they started seeing how much data they could collect from everyone who was visiting their website. 
sure. they started asking different questions. And that's the level of understanding I think we should be aiming for. But that requires students to be able to work with these tools and to explore them and to use them, but not necessarily train their own large language models. But if you say about uh, everybody, uh, uh, bringing every, everybody to the journey, uh, I imagine, again, like making it part of the Lehrpläne yeah. from scratch. In mathematics and whatever cross-sectional topics, yeah. it might be very interesting to thrive uh, with the topic of digitization and AI. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we should not make the mistake of creating just another subject, school mm. subject, but mm. rather empower those teachers that we have to, to, to g develop an understanding of how it changes their subject and how they can use in biology, in chemistry. There's so much yeah, yeah. that's already happening with people who know how to, how to use AI. Mm -hmm. These discussions need to happen in the subjects that we have, or as you said, even in cross-subject projects. And as we have an international audience out there, hopefully, um, do you have another country you look at where you think, okay, I, I don't name Finland or something like that because we had the PISA test and then we said now oh, everything is not like we thought it was or it is now. Yeah. <laughs> so, but where do you look at where they really uh, took on this journey quite successfully within the first steps or not first, but um, to be honest, I don't have a good example right now. Uh -huh. It's usually not whole countries, but rather individual institutions or sometimes even just individual professors, teachers mm -hmm. who start uh, changing things. Um, what I found really interesting, I, I gave a talk in an EU context, um, and then there was someone from Sweden who said, you know, um, we see that these large language models right now, they're very much um, Americanized in the way they think about the world. Um, or they display the world. If you ask ChatGPT what are the 10 most important philosophers or l whatever, the list will be very much biased towards the Western world. So they, for example, started training their own large language models in Swedish because they said it's not just that we can communicate with this tool in Swedish, it's that it represents our culture and our way of thinking and our perspective towards the world. So this is, these are developments. I really ask myself, really this, this really breaks the subject. I go for a next question. No, do we have another one? Yes, please, in third row. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. now. Um, I wanted to know how do you manage to have an interdisciplinary setting? And especially if you had maybe an example of where it was difficult and how you overcome this. Because I really like hearing about how something was kind of failing and then how you overcome this. Because I know, like, how did you m maybe uh, deal with uh, resistance? Or maybe this problem that sometimes between fields we have different expectations. For instance, in uh, AI ethics, usually they are the computer scientists that have a way of dealing with fairness, you know, and they have a really mathematical way to deal with this. And then you have the social scientists that will be like, nah, you know, <laughs> you can't really deal with this. And um, I see there's lots of efforts to do it, but sometimes it's difficult. I would be interested to know how you deal with this. Yeah, um, great question. So the key for us was actually the projects that our students were working on. Uh, because we saw, so even, I had a chance to build a university from scratch with all of that already in mind. So we had the mm. best starting situation that you, can, you mm -hmm. can ask for. And still we saw our faculty members separating among the lines that we tried to avoid because of course we have different subjects, different study programs, so they filed associated to different teams. But interestingly enough, once they started working with students who naturally teamed up in interdisciplinary projects because that's what they do all the time. They need to have team members from different disciplines. Um, the professors met because they were kind of supporting the same team and then they started having discussions based on the projects they were uh, involved with. So we have an STS program run by two philosophers and of course they have a different perspective on AI than our computer scientists. But if they come together on a frequent basis because they are responsible for the same team, then there's a place where they can have discussions. And we started emphasizing that by, by basically bringing them on stage internally and saying, let's, you can, let's have this discussion out in the open about how you think and how you approach these technology mm -hmm. and the ethical questions, for example, that might deal with it. So it, it's, it could be a way of bringing people together on, on interdisciplinary projects. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Any other question from your part? No. Oh, yes, we have one. Thank you very much. We, uh, I want to tell you, we have an almost gender, uh, a gendered audience with all sexes and genders in the room. So um, many females also. I just wanted to share this. This is very nice. So please. Hi, um, Ingo Kleiber, University of Cologne. Um, you made an interesting point about competencies, and I wanted to ask back. You basically said that students focus on those competencies that can't be substituted by AI, for example. And the question would be is, where's the boundary here? 
So has, and this is obviously a, a used example, has the calculator made doing math in your head obsolete? Probably not, maybe to a certain point. So where would you say is the line here in which competencies are going away over time and which ones are there to stay? And how do you see that in education or in fundamental education? That's a good but complicated <laughs> question. I, I, think, I don't think that's a binary thing. Um, and it's probably something that, um, that students could explore for themselves. Once they know how to use a calculator, they can, of course, start figuring out when to use it and maybe when not to use it and figure out it's still good if you memorized your calculation tables because it's sometimes much quicker um, than using a calculator. And, for example, we had discussions with our students on the subject um, because having a basic understanding of mathematics, even so you can use your calculator, helps you, for example, um, be involved in certain discussions or come to conclusions much quicker um, because you just have a feeling for it. In the end, I think we need to explore this together and figure it out. And on your way to building certain competencies, you will, of course, start with things that AI can already do today. Mm -hmm. But we have to make sure that students surpass it. And ideally, they can surpass it using the AI as a tool. Um, so it's an, uh, probably an iterative process, but we started, should start using, uh, having that discussion. Can I flip the question around? Because what I'm interested in is uh, in, uh, thinking of myself using GPS. I literally don't know where to go anywhere if I see a map. I totally lost the sense. So um, like projecting this to the, uh, to the future development, where do you think we have to think critically about what will AI take from us that we then might lose? If I go back to Ute Schmid this morning, she said, hmm, it's critical uh, in about uh, uh, complex structuring of things or something like that. She said, oh, let's be aware. We might lose this competency. Yeah. What do you think about yeah, the other side of the coin. That's uh, really a challenging, challenging question to ask. Uh, I, I agree. There's probably a lot of things that, that we still should be able to do without technology, even though we're still we're already or always using technology for it. But then again, I don't know if any one of you knows how to make butter anymore. <laughs> probably not, because we don't have to. So again, there's probably a lot of things we can just get rid of and um, still not suffer. But there might be a lot of things, again, that are really important to still be able to do without technology. Mm -hmm. and, but again, it, it always starts with being aware of these challenges, not that I have all the answers for it, but we should make sure that everyone's mm -hmm. aware of exactly that. And just for the GPS thing, um, mm -hmm. there's a quick, a quick fix, not fixes everything, but um, use the a map just always pointed to north. So I don't know if know where north is. <laughs> So you still have a basic idea of the directions, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't fix the problem. I mean, I just uh, my my older kids just got their um, their smartphones, and now they have a um, a telephone number. And I said to them, please memorize your telephone number and also mine and your mother's in case um, because people don't do this anymore. No, in case I mean, you lose your smartphone, we are yeah. lost. Manuel, it was fantastic to talk to you. Thank you very much for your many questions. Uh, time is up, so great to reconnect with you. Uh, thank you for your impulse. Thank you. Thank you very much.